We are very lucky also. Not uh, happy, but lucky. Yeah. So we're live now. We're live now. So okay. Uh, we're going to start to talk, and there are a number of people who couldn't join us. Uh, you know, uh, I think here we have also the problem uh, with uh, some others. Um, you know, last time we had uh, Astrid. Astrid now have difficulty to join, even though last time you saw her last time, right? No. Yeah. Okay. Michelle is trying to join, but uh, always in and out. So we may end up with uh, just a few people to have dialogue with, but nevertheless, that will be fine. <clears throat> Um, okay, so well, let's start. Um, even though we are missing quite a lot of the panelists, perhaps due to the technical difficulty, um, but today's session is about Belt and Road Initiative. Um, you know, uh, about Belt and uh, Road uh, Initiative. Uh, I see the, uh, the Astro trade is trying to join but uh, you know he has difficulties so my assistant is gonna try to help them out yeah uh, so basically we're gonna do a quick introduction of this team and then give our panelists uh, uh, you know uh, uh, everyone five minutes to talk about it and it first by introducing themselves uh, you know, for the for the um, for themselves and their organization. So China's Belt and Road Initiative has been um, uh, launched for uh, many years, and uh, some progress has already been made. We also see challenges of Belt and Road Initiative in some countries. And also, this session, we intend not to talk about just some basics about Belt and Road Initiative, what it is and where it is, but rather to focus on the current status of the initiative, the progress that has been made and challenges that are facing us and future outlook. So I would ask our panelists to first give a brief introduction of themselves and then to, um, to uh, 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 quickly just uh, ex express their view you know, in, in current situation. So I would like to first uh, to invite uh, Mr. Liu, uh, Mike Liu, from Center for China and Globalization, uh, to uh, give a short talk. So, uh, Mr. Liu. Thank you very much, Paul. And uh, it is uh, my great pleasure to be here this morning and uh, for the folks in Europe. And uh, I look at the, uh, the center uh, of uh, China and globalization is the uh, one of the uh, premium non-governmental think tank here in China. Uh, we have been uh, globally ranked as uh, in the 64 position out of top 100 think tank globally. And uh, one of the things uh, we have been deeply involved in international relations, geopolitics, trade issue, as well as uh, corporate governance, right? Uh, if I really look at the, uh, this uh, Bill and Road Initiative, uh, I look at it has been progressing well. Despite recently, it has been a bit uh, quieter. But uh, if I look at the, the from a data perspective, uh, it is working well. If you look at the China already signed 200 MOUs from uh, with uh, 138 countries and uh, also including 30 uh, international organizations. Uh, last year alone achieved uh, 1.4 trillion dollars in trades. Yeah, including both uh, import and uh, export. If you look at on a year over year basis, it's a 10.8% increase, right? So I look at things, uh, people also need to take some time to digest what that means, you know, bear on road initiative for other countries and see how all the countries can put our hands together. 
And if I also look at the uh, pandemic, uh, you know, when right now we're still right in the middle of that. And uh, the Chinese uh, investment in international market has been slowed down. But the, on the flip side of that is uh, the uh, land transport has been increased. Surprisingly, we found the, uh, the trade with uh, Europe, with uh, South Asia, with uh, Central Asia countries has been significantly grow year over year. I look at that's a very positive sign. Yeah. Now, thank you for your sharing and particularly some data. Uh, the the 200 MOU that you mentioned that has been signed, is that uh, uh, since the start of the initiative or just uh, in the last year? Since the start of the initiative. Okay, very good. And also, you mentioned the, the um, 1.4 trillion the trade that has been made last year and which represent about 10.8% of the jump. Now, um, with the pandemic, actually, this didn't slow down. Could you possibly explain why is that? I look at a couple of reasons. Uh, number one is uh, China government is able to quickly put this uh, pandemic in, inside of China under control. And uh, when China government is uh, pushing for this uh, dual circulation economy, which means uh, on the one hand, within China inside is under control, we try to boost the domestic uh, demand. And the other side is with leverage land transport to help those countries with more merchandise, right? So I look at the, you know, uh, with uh, this uh, cargo, uh, shipment by air has been on control, but we see a very drastic increase in the land transportation. Mm. How does this compare to a year before, for instance, 2019? I, I look at the, the, from the data point I have seen is here, uh, compared to the lighting have been increased uh, uh, if you look at the land transport has been increased by 50%. If you talk about number of trains going on between China and uh, Central Asia, as well as uh, Europe. And if you look at the volume, it's like a 7.3 times, right? And uh, also another data point is that with uh, this uh, pandemic, and uh, Southeast, Southeast Asia has become the number one trading partner with uh, China in uh, 2020. Yeah, so that's that's sort of uh, my hypothesis to some extent that um, out of the 1.4 trillion trade, um, you know, perhaps uh, a large chunk actually, um, you know, in the Southeast Asia region rather than from Europe region or is that correct? Well, uh, not necessarily. I, I look at the the, uh, the trading with the uh, Europe, yeah, between European Union and uh, China. If you look at the trade data back in the twenty twenty, the import last year from China is about uh, three uh, three hundred eighty three uh, billion euros from China into the Europe. And uh, the export from the Europe Union to China has been uh, also, you know, two point uh, two hundred and two billion euros, right? If you look at on a year uh, by year basis, uh, the last year into Europe has been increased by five point six, and uh, from Europe back to China is 2.2. Now I just experience, uh, you know, pandemic has a uh, determined factor if the, you know, the destination is in a better shape and uh, should be able to activate more goods transport between uh, two regions. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for, for your initial reaction to this. And, and next, I would like to uh, welcome Ikram uh, Sergal, Chairman, Past Founder Group from Pakistan. So if you could just uh, briefly introduce yourself and your organization and then uh, make your initial speech. Right, uh, Pathfinder Group is about uh, 12,000 people spread all over Pakistan. 
um, in about 75 cities and towns. We have two main divisions. Uh, one, uh, the security services division, which has got five companies, uh, looks after man guarding, cash in transit, uh, including ATMs. It looks after uh, security services surveillance. It looks after uh, you know, verifications, inquiries, etc. And there's one company, FSMS, which does um, actually uh, all things together in the sense that a building requires uh, to be have plumbing or have to have electricians, have to have people with elevators, running elevators, etc. So it takes on all the security uh, things which are not directly related to security, but a part of security in the, in the overall sense. So, so that is in the security service division. And that is our main this thing. We have got about 400 armored cars flying throughout Pakistan, servicing banks, etc. The second part of it is uh, 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 financial services technology division in which there are three companies, which are IT companies, basically. One is a service company, uh, this is the i3 Pathfinder. The other one is Virtual Remittance Gateway, VRG, which is the flagship company. And the third is iPath, which basically uh, makes software. Now, uh, we are the only company in Pakistan which has been uh, given permission by the State Bank of Pakistan and also by the Pakistan Telecommunication Authority as a regulator for financial inclusion the World Bank Bank's financial inclusion scheme. 80% of Pakistan adult population is without bank accounts. And very difficult for them to open bank accounts. Now with our uh, facilitator switch, uh, which really, you can actually open a bank account in less than one minute with 15 banks. You have a menu and 15 banks can open an account for less than five, uh, five minutes, but they're all connected to our, you know, our spectrum of, uh, you know, data verification, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, we have officially not launched out as yet, uh, even though we have got 500,000 accounts now uh, already. And the transactions, we have over a million transactions have already taken place. And if you look at from the point about uh, $300 million worth of transactions have already happening as we speak today. Basically, it is meant as a default payment gateway. And we are working on that. You can really pay for services from there. You connect, we have got four telcos, four uh, like Telenor, we've got Jazz, we've got Uphone, and we've got um, uh, 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 Zong, uh, Zong. So these four telcos are all connected with us, and with that, they're connected to 15 banks, and that's how we operate. So that is our broad spectrum of what we do, right? Uh, as, as far as uh, uh, the Belt Road Initiative is concerned, without question, Pakistan is the largest beneficiary, without question, right? And without question, uh, we are very grateful for China for having supported us in this process throughout. And I say that, uh, like I said, from personal experience, 50 years ago to the day, almost to the day in 1970, in fact, I was uh, actually attached to the People's Liberation Army, flying a helicopter pilot as a pilot, attached from the Pakistan Army Aviation with them, because they didn't have helicopters at that time, as, as much as you would believe it. You know, in the Karakoram Mountains, uh, when they were making the road, the Karakoram Highway, uh, there were no, I think two PLA divisions at that time were making the highway. And we were, I was attached with them uh, for liaison purposes, for communication purposes, uh, for lifting their uh, injured, etc. And I must say, uh, the Chinese have paid a great sacrifice, human lives, to make that road. So that was the road to the highest mountain in the world. You know, the Karakoram Mountains, uh, next to them uh, has the highest, second highest, third highest, and fourth highest mountain in the world, K2, Nanga Parbat, etc. So, what is BRI for us? BRI for us is what makes us center page to the world. If you look at it, it gives China an opening to the Indian Ocean, right? The no what we call the Northeast Southwest Corridor through the Karakrams and really connects China to the vast network of roads in the Middle East and into Africa. Really, it's a tremendous issue. At the same time, it provides China with, uh, let us take, for example, I mean, just to give an example of uh, soya bean from Brazil. Uh, it, uh, China exports in 83,000 tons of uh, soya bean, right? Most of it goes to Southwest China. Now, if it were going to Southwest China, 
They've come from Brazil all the way by sea to Shanghai or some other port there and then go all across China to uh, Xinjiang province. Now, if you have the same thing, you cut down the sea land by about one by two thirds to Gwadar. And then you cut down the landline by about another uh, two thirds. So basically, a, a shipment which takes 45 days would take only 15 days for you and much less cost. So for us, uh, the uh, uh, you know, and particularly the fact that China has put in $46 billion worth of $26 billion in front of infrastructure in the form of bridges and roads, right? And power stations, uh, in fact, sorry, I'm sorry, uh, the power stations, $26 billion worth of power stations to build up Pakistan's uh, power uh, requirements and to give enough power to Pakistan to, from new cities and new industrial towns as they come. And as we go along, China is investing in more dams for Pakistan so that we have, we look after, you know, because Pakistan basically is an agriculture country. You know, we feed ourselves. This is one of the few countries in the world that can feed ourselves and clothe ourselves, right? So we are uh, really benefiting by that. But very important, which people miss out, is also that we are a North-South corridor. We are a corridor from Russia, Europe, Central Asia, Afghanistan, down to um, Pakistan, right down to the coast. So we are also a North-South corridor. And with the North-South corridor, if you look at it, we are the pivot for, uh, for three continents, for Euro Europe, for Asia, and for uh, Africa. We are the pivot for three continents, road and rail travel. Where our problem is, is South East Asia and South Asia. We have a problem with India. And because we have a problem in India, the road and rail access to South Asia is not there, right? Even for South Asia. South Asia and India is a great beneficiary if it solves the problems with us and we is connected, right? So you can have a container being loaded at a warehouse in Calcutta and being unloaded in Paris. You have a container uh, loaded in um, uh, uh, Calcutta, unloaded in Johannesburg, right? In uh, by truck or rail or road. So Pakistan is a great, great beneficiary. We are very thankful to China. We cannot emphasize this. We cannot, we cannot even say how much China has changed the lives of Pakistanis by bringing. Yes, there is no doubt that benefits China. There is no doubt. Yes, but even then. China believed in us, and because China believed in us, they invested in us, and because they invested in us, I think we have perhaps one of the greatest futures. I was the other day, just today in the morning, just today in the morning, Dr. Frederick Starr, Dr. Frederick Starr, who is the head, who was the head actually now of John Hopkins in Central Asian Studies for 30 years, he sent me a message. He said, You are right with civilization started it straight. You are right 2,000 years ago. This was the route 2,000 years ago from China to Asia and Africa. 2,000 years later, by default, we have the same route. So I think really if you look at it. I feel that not much is known about the BRI. I think we need to really make much more known about the BRI. We need to get, yes, we are getting, by the way, uh, people say that Western, yes, we are getting West investment. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to say, but a lot of interest is coming in from Europe. A lot of interest coming in from Europe, right, uh, uh, for uh, investment into uh, uh, into Pakistan, particularly into this belt. So I think it's a win-win situation, and I think in a win-win situation, we must exploit it, right? I am happy. I'm going to be 75, inshallah, next month, right? And 50 years ago. I, for, to me, it was a dream, right? At least I see this dream coming true, thanks to China. Well, thank, thank you for your heartfelt comments. And first of all, I uh, wish you happy birthday next uh, month. <laughs> thank you. Uh, hope you have a great celebration. Um, yeah, you. you have uh, mentioned a, a lot of very interesting, important points. So. One of that, which is the heart of the Belt and Road Initiative, is infrastructure investment. 
And so、um, building bridges and highways and, and、uh, railways、uh, in the regions that that、uh, the Belt Road Initiative had went to. Can you can you uh, uh, talk about? You know, this is a, a heavy investment, which、uh, the payoff seems to be. To usually in the West, it takes many years to build a road, highways.、Um, but could you talk about you know a little bit about the speed of Belt and Road Initiative in Pakistan? How how it was implemented? You know, like how long it, it will take to build a highway and railway versus you know what you saw before in other places. Well, I want to give you just an idea of how fast things happen. About、uh, two years ago, in Gwadar,、uh, there was only one five-star hotel, right? And that five-star hotel was overcrowded because, you know, obviously they had only about maybe 150 rooms, right? And there were a lot of people coming in. There was a、uh, there was a air- airport, which was okay. It was good for、uh, you know taking this thing, but the infrastructure was not there. China built a five-star hotel in seven months there. In seven months, that is remarkable, right? I, I had I, I went and had authentic Chinese food, you know, about two months ago, you know, for the for after a long time in Gwadar, right? So, as far as the bridges etc. roads are concerned, you cannot imagine the speed. You cannot imagine the speed, right? I think where we we are stuck at the moment is about the train side. We are a little stuck on the train side, not for any other reason, but that bureaucracy on our side, you know, is bureaucracy. You know, the, uh, we uh, we learned a lot from the British, and one of the things we learned was、uh, to our detriment was bureaucracy, right? And that bureaucracy is holding up、uh, things, you know, uh, uh, as they go along. But the point is that China is ready to invest. Russia is ready to invest. Russia is ready to invest on the north-south corridor, right? So, I feel, uh, but but the, look at the power stations. The power stations we normally take seven, eight years to build, took three years, two years, three years. You know, a nuclear a nuclear power station,、uh, which is about、uh, almost thousand megawatts in near Karachi, right? Believe me, when it was launched, it actually started operating. Karachites could not believe it. Because they say, oh, it was inaugurated only two years ago. How come in two years' time we start producing electricity? So the speed is there from the Chinese side, from the Pakistan side. Our problem is bureaucracy. Our problem is bureaucracy. And I think a lot of people are doing a lot of work to ensure, and particularly the government, Imran Khan's government, is fight, doing day and night to make sure they overcome these hurdles of bureaucracy. Thank you, thank you for that sharing、uh, of the speed.、Um, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative is a long-term, you know, very visionary,、um, you know,、uh, initiative. But at the same time, in terms of executions, you know, seems to be quite fast in terms of progress that has already been made.、Um, also, could you talk about a little bit about, you know, the local employment? Um, through the Belt and Road Initiative, and also the 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 the, 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 the wealth and poverty issues, you know,、uh, did the, the local people benefit from the、uh, the、uh, the Belt and Road、uh, Road Initiative in terms of the the jobs and the the the, the improvement in the livelihood? Yes, and to an extent, no. Yes, for the reason. That whenever you have a road or railway line going through an area, underdeveloped area, you will have commercial establishments coming in that area. You will have industrial establishments coming in that area, right? We had a security problem, as you know, because of Afghanistan. We had a security problem. Because of the security problem, that uh, uh, commensurate development, commercial development, was delayed. Now it is picked up speed. Now it is picked up speed, and we expect. You know, the, and the next uh, uh, this thing, etc. You know, one does not really which side Afghanistan will go, right? You know, at the moment it's in a transition period, right?、Uh, you know, the government which is there, which is not really a representative government, right? May last, may not. I don't think it will last, right? But we have to see where the Taliban have matured enough. The Taliban have matured enough to make it all inclusive, 
if they make it all inclusive then we've got a great future in this area but if they're not inclusive and they try to go back to the 90s then i'm i suppose uh, we'll be in trouble but uh, as far as the pakistan side is concerned the pakistan armed forces have done a terrific job uh, areas which were no go areas vast areas in no go areas in our border areas are now totally under control we have fenced the border with afghanistan and that is uh, actually there so i expect that uh, the, the employment will be there as more and more uh, industrial zones come up as more and more this in, employment will increase yes no um very good thank you for your sharing what that i obviously have more you know questions uh, to ask but let's go to our next uh, speaker so uh you we michel the executive vice president of alliance group uh in germany so uh if you can you know introduce yourself and your company and also make your uh opening speech <laughs> Thank you very much, yeah? Professor Borgi, thank you very much. Thank you for having me here. I'm, uh, uh, I'm highly honored and uh, best regards also to Frank. It's always um, extremely interesting and fruitful to discuss here. My special greetings to Pakistan and to Ikram. We're always sitting together in, 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 the, in, in the channel and this is very, very good. And I'm completely surprised about 75 years. It cannot be, yeah? There must be a calculating, <laughs> a calculating error. Calculating. <laughs> all, all the best. All the best. Too. Thank you. Um, it's fascinating sitting here in Munich, in, in the middle of good old Europe. Yeah, uh, seeing the uh, Belt and Road Initiative yes, growing. Beautiful. Beautiful. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Very well. From... Thank you. The Belt and Road, sitting in good old Europe, seeing the speed of building airports seeing the discussion of building a new railway line, seeing all the discussion how we're taking care of our energy. And on the other hand, seeing now Ikram here with this uh, fascinating report, how fast the Belt and Road Initiative is changing the country, how efficient and effective the political idea, maybe the historical idea, is making progress. Getting a view of the, getting a view of the of a map uh, of Europe, Africa, and Asia in front of me, understanding how this Belt and Road is really connecting these three continents. There are the two reactions. One is, um, I'm astonished. We are, we are seeing how fast this is going. The second reaction is we get a bit concerned, seeing how fast it will go. And then we are talking here, what, how can we step in what does it mean for us here in Europe? Where is our contribution? Where can we improve the overall process? So it's a, a very, very intense thing. And by starting with this introduction, I'm representing Allianz. Allianz is a 130-year-old insurance company. It's one of the biggest, if not the biggest insurance company of the world. But we're also one of the biggest investors uh, worldwide. We are one of the leading asset managers and in this capacity as an international insurer, as an international investor, Belt and Road apparently is absolutely interesting for us. We're asking ourselves how can we be part of it? And that would be then my introduction. What are we as Allianz doing, doing with Belt and Road? We are using the Belden, I remember we one, one of the first uses transporting arts, artifacts from Duisburg. This is the end point of the railway of Belden Road into China for an exhibition. We are ensuring yeah, a lot of, uh, lot of transport, a lot of transport on that road. But we could not, and this is, that's, um, this is sad, and this is definitely also something to consider, we could not participate in our core business in the Belt and Road. We were, we were checking various projects over the last 10 years, and I was part of that, in the insurance field. So can we ensure the building of a dam in, in Pakistan or the building of a railway in, in Pakistan? This is one of our core businesses we are driving over the last 100 years. But simply the rates, simply the, the, the money we can make out of it, compared to the risks of building a dam, 
was not uh, was not acceptable for us. The next step I was trying to do was with CIC, China Investment Corporation, talking to Chinese uh, state banks, especially Bank of China, um, discussions um, on board levels so or on my board level, but also my, uh, my my people discussing that. Okay, you need money. We have money. We are looking for investments. And the investment is pretty much interesting for us. Being part of the infrastructure projects, you need money. We have money. We uh, we are representing more than 50 million insurers. It's a long-term investment, infrastructure investments, all that what we like. We really like that. We really would we really would love to do that. But the further we were investigating, the further we were discussing, we realized um, in terms and conditions, the return. On, on an investment for a privately run insurer like like Allianz in the Belt and Road Initiative was not it was not simply com was not competitive enough yeah and and far away of being a far away of being competitive enough I then was discussing with the World Bank whether we can have some structures but it's going now too much too much into details so what I what I want to what I want to point out uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is economically hugely successful. And I'm hearing what Ikram is saying is really, really impressive, really impressive. And having traveled for Pakistan many, many times and set up a company there, I, I only can underline, yes, this is all right. But it's not primarily, and I would like to give this, this question back to you, to my, to my colleagues in the panel. It's primary, it's primary <clears throat> not an economic initiative, it's a political initiative. And then I would ask, yes, if it's a political initiative, what are then the consequences hmm, of being uh, of being a political initiative? So we have difficulties to step in. So we are in a situation that we have a highly successful, extremely fast-growing political initiative with, with Belt and Road. And I will come to an end. Uh, I don't want to take too much time just to underline, yeah, just to underline that it is so successful, just to underline that uh, people in the West and governments in, in, in the West are going concerned on that. I, I, I was reading over the weekend in, in uh, the Financial Times, in other Western newspapers, the G7, a G7 uh, meeting, I think it was in, somewhere in the UK, you know, which took place, we were discussing this tax issue, the international tax issue for, for big companies. They were also discussing an initiative of G7, which goes into infrastructure, which has initiative of what can the G7, meaning Western countries, do to somehow compete with the Belt and Road initiatives. That, that shows how successful Belt and Road is. If not, the G7 would not think what can we do to add, what can we do not, in inverted commas, open against it. But that brings these initiatives on a much more, even more important, even more important level as it is right now. And with this, I would really love, uh, love to stop and pass back for questions and pass back to G. Please, yeah. please. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for your very good sharing, particularly coming from the insurance industry. So you have shared some of the challenges, uh, you know, there. Um, you know, of course, that's a, a more specific uh, related to the insurance uh, industry. And, and uh, your thoughts on the economic success and the political challenge uh, it's been a, a spot on. Uh, we can have a little bit discussion to extend on that. Um, so uh, indeed, uh, the investment into the, uh, you know, we, we have to understand that currently the global geopolitical, you know, landscape is different from, uh, um, you know, many years ago. Mm -hmm. So and now, particularly with uh, Americans um, under the Biden administration, in the Trump administration, has, Trump has offended many uh, allies. Uh, so um, uh, many, many allies are actually choosing on the side of the China. But with Biden now uh, in power, he's um, taking a all the diplomatic approach and is trying to isolate China to some extent, in my view. Uh, and, and he's trying to get the allies back one by one. Um, so I think this is this G7's action that has a lot to do with that, uh, you know, rather than just simply, that's my opinion, rather than just simply to compete economically, um, but rather to, uh, you know, if, if we remember, uh, the reason the Belt and Road Initiative created it was the China's fear 
of uh, the Americans' aggression towards China. Uh, you know, Obama era has created uh, uh, this um, a treaty uh, uh, to exclude the China from the trading zone and excluding China from the East Asia trading zone. And, and so, uh, so the next China was forced that, okay, we, we can't rely on you, so what should we do? So let's take a Belt and Road Initiative as a, as, as a way to do. So, so I think, uh, in my humble opinion, um, this political issue right now presented to the world is, uh, uh, has a lot to do with uh, um, Americans' uh, uh, strategy of treating China as a competitor. Because Biden clearly says that Russia is a threat, but China is a competitor. Uh, so uh, that's his personal statement. So that says a lot about, you know, what, uh, you know, this uh, G7's uh, initiative. I want to hear other people's comments as well. So, Paul, if I may, uh, maybe also I can share my perspective. If you look at the uh, One Road, One, uh, the Road and the Bell initiative was started in China. If you look at in the beginning, many people was very skeptical about what the China real intention. And uh, if I really, as I share all those data says, right? And the uh, people uh, have been really built up the strong, much stronger alliances between China, Central Asia, Pakistan, and uh, Europe as well, right? I look at the uh, one of things is really, I look at the Bell and Road Initiative. Now we are in the beginning of uh, chapter two, right? Chapter two is really for all the stakeholders, how we can come back with uh, the good governance and the transparency. This is not one country initiative, but uh, all those countries, we want to put our hands together and uh, to build the transparency, governance, uh, as well as uh, alliances, right? Like uh, we were saying, if you look at the, uh, you know, the uh, get the insurance uh, deals in Pakistan or maybe in uh, Uzbekistan, in those uh, uh, places, how we can have a global, you know, alliances body, right? How we can set a set of rules everybody follow. Right. I look at the, you know, my personal view, even G7 can also can, uh, have a role to play in this, uh, bill and role initiative. If a G7 countries, they see a value for, you know, from that, uh, they need to look at this uh, not only from, uh, you know, because of China or because, uh, underlying political issue, but we'll see the true benefit of, uh, you know, trade and the deals and the project you know, among those, uh, all the stakeholders. I look at what's missing is, uh, if we're in the chapter two, how we should be able to see more alliances among multinationals. And, uh, we have uh, a multinationals forum to, uh, in everybody sit together to set set of rule and to, to govern the policy as well as, uh, best practice, right? Where the countries uh, can also step in to enable MMCs to work together, right? And uh, if we can do that, and uh, we will definitely create a very different picture for Bill and Roe uh, Ro initiative. Yeah, no, no, thank you for your sharing. So uh, I agree The chapter two of the Belt and Road Initiative, as you mentioned, requires more collaboration, in-depth collaborations to leverage what has already, you know, been done and also some of the lessons has draw and some of the area that has been ignored particularly. Um, so enhance all those, uh, you know, uh, stakeholders benefit uh, not just, uh, you know, selected few, but, you know, everybody who are involved will benefit, you know, strongly from that. So uh, that that is very important, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, steps uh, for that. Um, so, oh, yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah. If I may, I also do have uh, the data point to support, you know, uh, previous question you asked. From the China side, we have seen total 330,000 local jobs has been created in all these uh, build and roll countries. And uh, from the China side, 
effort has contributed three billion US dollars local tax revenue for the, all the various government, right? I look at this uh, data point from China perspective, but uh, if in the chapter two, we can see all the country, you know, be able to see, you know, under this umbrella of the Bill and Road Initiative, we have a credit job, we have uh, contribute to the local business uh, society. Then they will achieve the purpose of uh, this uh, cross-border collaboration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so the number you mentioned, the job creation, is the job creation throughout the Belt and Road Initiative or is just from the Chinese side in terms of job creation? No, it's uh, yeah, throughout the Bill and Road countries. Yeah, okay. It's local jobs in those uh, bear and roll countries. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, Ikram, so if I may ask for your comments about uh, the particular question uh, which uh, uh, Michelle had mentioned, uh, the uh, Belt and Road Initiative is an economically successful project, but politically, you know, challenging. You know, so how do you think of uh, the G7's uh, uh, position in terms of competing with the Belt and Road Initiative? No, I, I think, you know, to start with, I think uh, there's a lot of misapprehension and misconception about the Belt and Road Initiative, right? One of the misconceptions is that maybe China is building up a lot of naval bases in this area, right? Like, for example, uh, they've talked about Gwadar as a possible naval base, right? Chinese naval base. This is totally wrong. Uh, I was there only a few... Uh, uh, I was there only a few... Yeah, I was there only a few, uh, uh, you know, uh, weeks ago in Gwadar. There was not a single Chinese ship there. There was not a single Chinese ship, right? And so... You know, and, and so these misconceptions, as you know, uh, that thing, etc. And most of these misconceptions has been because of local, uh, uh, you know, uh, rivalry. Like, for example, India does not want China in the Indian Ocean. Right? So because of that, they are they, they oppose anything that China does. Yeah. And because India has got a very good, uh, you know, media, this thing, and India, the West looks at the India as a possible a country which can contain China. So it believes, uh, like gospel truth, what India says. I believe, my own belief is, the economics will uh, will overcome all these hurdles. The economics will overcome all these hurdles. And I, I tell you, I, I don't want to mention the name of the company in West Germany, because we've got, uh, you know, sorry, from Germany, because we've got it. But there are two companies, major companies, investing today, thinking of not investing, but seriously thinking of investing in this area, in huge mega projects, huge mega projects. They would not just come like that. They would not come like that. Similarly, you have a lot of other companies now uh, wanting to, you know, from, from France, from uh, Spain, from, uh, you know, uh, countries which want to come into, uh, let's see, Russia, you know, really, really wanting to come in with, 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 and, uh, because they feel that the main ring line, ring line will give it, you know, the warm waters uh, of the Indian Ocean, which they've been dreaming about for centuries, right? I think economics will overcome these challenges. And I think when people realize that there is no military involvement, that thing, but I don't want to mention something uh, which I forgot. Uh, there is a network of roads and railways existing in this area. There used to be uh, uh, there used to be something known as, uh, you know, the uh, we, we, uh, we, we had an alliance here, which was known as the Baghdad Pact. And the Baghdad Pact then, you know, became CENTO, Central Treaty Organization. Along with CENTO, you know, they had a re RCD, Regional Cooperation for Development. During the Regional Cooperation, they built up roads and railways in Turkey, Iran, and Pakistan. Turkey, Iran, and Pakistan, they built up tremendous amount of roads. Now, all these need upgrading. Obviously, because they are maybe about 40, 50 years old, etc. But the network already exists, right? And if you have, if you if you really, uh, you know, uh, uh, this thing, invest in that network more, just upgrading it, I think you have a wonderful opportunity right there. And all the Central Asian states, you know, 
the first container from Uzbekistan has already gone through Gwadar port. The first container from Pakistan has already gone through Gwadar port. And it has gone on truck loads. So I think you have a win-win situation there. Hmm. Yeah, well, thank you so much for your very clear-minded statement. Economics perhaps will overcome, you know, political issues. What a wonderful summary of this. It, you know, that says a lot about the Belt and Road Initiative. It was built on the, the ancient wisdom of the Silk Road Initiative. So there is a, um, there is a, a direct and a real need of those regions in order to continue to develop, to uh, thrive in economic situation. Do we only wish for the best for the Belt and Road Initiative? So I would like to thank for our you know, panelists, our speakers, who spare their very precious time to join us.